Um, Professor Wingfield graduated with a PhD in sociology from John Hopkins University in 2004 and is a leading figure in the study of racial and gender inequality. She's a prolific author, six books, including her most recent Flatlining Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy, and numerous journal articles in leading journals. Um, Professor Wingfield has received a string of accolades, including the Public Understanding of Sociology Award from the American, Econo American, American Sociological Association. I have to <laughs> not uh, get contaminated by my own field. Um, the uh, Distinguished Book Award in Race, Gender, and Class from the American Sociological Association, and the Richard A. Lester Award for Outstanding Book in Labor Economics and Industrial Relations from Princeton University. Um, she is an elected member of the Sociological Research Association and has served as president of Sociologists for Women and the Southern Sociological Society. Um, Professor Wingfield has held a number of editorial positions at leading scholarly journals and written extensively in the popular press about race and gender in the professions. Uh, we are very lucky to have such a distinguished scholar with us today. And um, let us give a warm welcome to Professor Isia Harvey Wingfield. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you everyone for your attendance here. Uh, I am aware that I am standing between us and happy hour, so I will try to make this as engaging as possible to keep everybody with us. So the title of the presentation today is Not Just Identity, How Intersectional Approaches Help Understand Organizations, Workplaces, and More. And so you'll find that a lot of what I'll talk about today relates back to some of the things that we heard other colleagues talk about in terms of their research and reasons why intersectional work is useful and helpful. But what I want to try to do is to hearken back to its original roots and to think about the origins of intersectionality as a framework and then talk a little bit about why and how it offers some broader utility in the way that we think about and understand work, organizations, and inequality. Okay, so I won't be using the clicker. <laughs> uh, so the key themes of the talk and the main things that I'm going to touch on are, first of all, what even is intersectionality? We've talked about it all day and we've used it as a conceptual framework. I want to go back to the core of the term and go back to Crenshaw's work to identify its utility and its origins. I want to then talk about why it matters, and then I want to talk about how it offers a more nuanced understanding of work organizations and economics, as I said. So if we go back to this original idea of intersectionality, the term has been bandied about a lot, particularly of late, but this is an actual theoretical term that was coined by legal scholar Kimberly Williams Crenshaw back in 1988. And there are people even preceding Crenshaw who have employed what we would today call an intersectional approach. But Crenshaw is the one who initially came up with this term and introduced it into, in several articles in various legal journals. And the one that I'll talk about today is an article that she coined and used the term to design to highlight the ways that black women were excluded from legal claims to employment discrimination, which is particularly relevant for us today as people who are thinking about uh, work and people who are employed in organizations. Uh, Crenshaw argued that when she took a review of a lot of the literature in the legal field, many sex discrimination claims were premised on white women, while race discrimination claims were premised on black men. And so she argues that adding black women into these existing frameworks is insufficient, because the way that many of these uh, legal cases were construed was to make an argument that if sex discrimination was happening, then the kind of modal worker that could be used to understand this discrimination had to be a white woman. The corollary for race discrimination was that the modal worker used was a black man. But part of Crenshaw's argument, which we'll dig into shortly, is how and why there are such shortcomings to those approaches and how and why those, ar those arguments really fall short for understanding black women's experiences. And that black women can't just be slotted into the experiences of white men and black women, their experiences are distinctly different. And to put it in her own words, because she says this better than I can, because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. So let's walk through these court cases and take a look at what she's arguing and how she's making the case that these court cases reflect this lack of an intersectional approach. The first court case that she references is DeGraff and Reed versus General Motors. And this is a case where the plaintiffs, DeGraff and Reed, argued that General Motors' seniority system discriminated against black women. And so what Crenshaw found was that the plaintiffs made the case that prior to 1964, there simply were no black women hired at the GM plant in question. 
all of the black women who were hired after 1970 ended up being dismissed in seniority-based layoffs. So the argument that these plaintiffs were making were that these seniority-based layoffs amounted to discriminatory action because black women were disproportionately affected by this decision to lay off workers who had the least amount of seniority. By virtue of long-term, long-standing employment discrimination, black women were disproportionately affected by this court decision. However, the court ruled that black women were not a protected class. They made the argument that GM had actually hired women, although the women that they had hired were all white, so therefore there could not have been sex discrimination. What they did was to advise the plaintiffs to join an existing race discrimination case. Oh, excuse me, existing race discrimination case. But ultimately, Crenshaw points out that the court dismissed the plaintiffs' claim that the discrimination that they were experiencing was a result not just of race, but of intersections of race and gender that shaped the particular employment experiences that black women had had over the long term. So she cites this as a first example of a case where black women's specific experiences were not given credence under the law, and where white women's experiences of gender discrimination were construed as the stand-in and the modal example of what gender discrimination looked like in the legal setting. The next case that she cites is Moore versus Hughes Helicopter Incorporated. And here we have a case where the plaintiff, Moore, argued that Hughes engaged in both race and sex discrimination in the promotion process. So that again, black women experienced the, both racial discrimination and gender discrimination in ways that kept them from moving into advancement and moving up the corporate ladder into higher status positions. But here what we found was that the courts would not certify Moore a black woman as the representative in a class action suit. And when they gave their explanation for why they would not do so, they argued that her claims of facing discrimination as a black woman, not just as a woman, preclude her from adequately representing white women. So once again, Moore makes this case that what we find here is that this situates white women's experiences as the standard for sex discrimination, right? If the courts are making the case that as a black woman, Moore doesn't serve as an adequate plaintiff because she's not able to represent white women, ultimately what they are doing is they are suggesting that black women's experiences cannot be representative of or inclusive of the experiences of all women and implicitly prioritizing and privileging white women in this role. Uh, more, excuse me, Crenshaw argues that the courts thus are ignoring that sex discrimination can occur for all women, but have particularly harsh implications for some groups of women, black women in particular. And finally, the third court case that she cites to make her argument is the Payne versus Travenal case. And here's another example where black women workers attempted to bring a class action suit claiming racial discrimination. And so what we have here is a bit of a parallel to the first case that I mentioned, where we have that the courts deny the plaintiff's request to represent black workers, instead allowing them only to represent black women employees. And in this case, unlike the first two, the courts did find a judgment for the black women who were the plaintiffs, but they then refused the application and the remedy to black men. And they did so on the grounds that black men's experiences were too dissimilar for those, too dissimilar from black men for them to qualify as getting redressed vis-a-vis -vis the lawsuit. So we have here three different cases of legal claims that Ken Crenshaw relies on to make her point about where the court system at the time had significant blind spots when it comes to thinking about black women's experiences. What she suggests here are that existing legal frameworks for assessing employment discrimination in workplaces are highly limited. They are limited because they exclude the ways that black women experience multifaceted forms of discrimination as a function of both race and gender. And Collins makes clear, sorry, Crenshaw makes clear in this argument that sometimes this discrimination may parallel that facing white women or may fa parallel that facing black men. But she also makes the point that other times it may be distinctly different. So she suggests that if we look at how discrimination has an impact on black women, we may find that broader examples of uh, gender discrimination may certainly have an impact on black women in ways that are similar to what white women experience. This might have to do with policies around parental leave or wage gaps or so forth. But they also may have an Im impact with discrimination that is also parallel to what black men might experience. So there may be ways that these experiences of discrimination affect black women, but they also reflect the way that these experiences can be layered together. And they also can have an implication where there are brand new experiences of discrimination that singularly impact black women, such as in the first case, that may not necessarily be present for uh, white women or for black men. Ultimately, what Crenshaw argues, and what we've seen in a lot of the research discussed today, is that intersectionality exposes how single axes frameworks for discrimination, e.g. focusing only on race, only on gender, and so forth, overlook the ways that these processes affect black women. So this is just to give people a background of the initial contours of this argument, on the off chance that you haven't had time to go back to the University of Chicago Law Review recently and read this paper. But these are ultimately the core claims that Crenshaw is making in this argument. As I mentioned, this was published in 1988. So this is a bit of an older piece, but this is what lays the framework 
for how this argument gets used in sociology, in legal circles, and in other cases. So where are we now? If we take a look at uh, the fact that time has passed and consider where we stand in academic circles, at least, with Crenshaw's arguments and her work, what we find is that her arguments present a framework for thinking about how discrimination operates along multiple axes. Uh, in intervening years, however, intersectionality has often been misused, it's been mislabeled and misapplied. We see this present in the ways that many uh, lay people or some researchers themselves tend to reduce intersectionality to just simply identity politics, which I know is a term common in the US. I'm not sure if it's frequently used here in the UK as well. Okay, so when we hear this applied in the US, often the case that people make is that uh, intersectionality is just a way for people to try to compete over multiple claims of discrimination. And it pits different groups against each other because it argues them to try to out outdo each other in a so-called oppression Olympics, right? or that it just simply uh, reduces groups to various facets of identity and that it doesn't do much more than that. And we see this present often in common, we see this present in common often in ill-informed attempt, in Ill -informed attempts to conflate it with critical race theory, which is a separate and distinct legal theory that focuses on the ways that racial inequality becomes embedded in and through organizations, but is something that's different from and distinct from intersectionality. But what I want to argue for the rest of this presentation is that intersectional approaches can actually help us to better understand work and employment. Far from simply being reduced to, intersect, to uh, identity politics and simply being a way of thinking about identity in and of itself, if you look at the basics of the framework that Crenshaw is putting forth, what she actually offers is a very nuanced and layered way of thinking about how we can have a better understanding of the ways that various processes occur in workplaces, in organizations, and in the economy itself that give us a more nuanced view of of the dynamics of power and inequality. And this is one of the key aspects of intersectionality framework that often gets lost when people seek to try to dismiss it as just about identity. Crenshaw and other later intersectionality scholars that follow have often been really clear that the key uh, attribute and the key asset that comes out of intersectional theory is not just kind of armchair academic exercise of pointing out where these differences lie, but thinking about how these differences undergird institutional structures and create various power dynamics that are very useful for understanding how institutions, organizations, and society at large are structured. So I'll talk a little bit first about how uh, intersectional theory gives us broader insights about occupations, or focusing on specific occupations. And I'll do this by talking a bit about some of the research on men working in female-dominated fields. Uh, research in this area suggests that for men working in fields dominated by women, their experiences are likely to differ very significantly from women working in jobs that are more male-dominated. We know from the work on women working in male-dominated jobs that they are likely to experience a glass ceiling, which is to say they work their way up to a certain point and then they are likely to hit an, invis hit, hit an invisible barrier where they find it difficult, if not impossible, to advance to the next stage in the organization. But in contrast, the research on men working in women-dominated occupations shows a different phenomena, and it argues that they experience what researchers refer to as a glass escalator rather than a glass ceiling. And the glass escalator is a process where men working in these female-dominated jobs actually have to struggle to stay in place because there are so many social processes that seek to push them up the ladder and into higher status jobs. So in a research study that focuses on men working in library sciences, nursing, education, and social work, Researchers found that men engaged in multiple processes that helped them to ride the glass escalator. They engaged in intentional distancing from their women colleagues where they would kind of make jokes or often disparaging comments about the femininity associated with their fields. They were able to find, form closer ties to men who were employed uh, in the profession or adjacent to the profession. And they were frequently subject of perceptions of fit for leadership positions that enabled an advancement. So for example, if you take the case of men who were working as uh, K through 12 teachers, what you would find from this research is that those men would often kind of distance themselves from getting too close to their women colleagues who were teachers, but they might form closer ties to men who were in, in higher status advancement roles, men who were principals or men who were superintendents. As a consequence of those relationships and their distancing from the field and of the uh, perceptions that people often brought to the occupation, many times these men were assumed to be people who either were interested in principalship positions or on the fast track to principalship, principalship positions. And as a consequence of the, inter the interaction of these factors, these men found themselves on the fast track to these types of administrative roles, often without really trying or without necessarily expressing interest. So rather than hitting obstacles, men working in these uh, feminized fields actually struggle to stay in place rather than hitting the glass ceiling that, that uh, other researchers described. 
But we find we take an intersectional approach, is that this experience for black men looks a bit different. And so here, what I'm basing this on is my own research on a study of black men working in the nursing profession. And I was uh, motivated to conduct this study after reading a lot of the work on men working in female-dominated occupations and feeling a bit skeptical about some of the conclusions and wondering if those experiences would apply to black men, particularly the experience of a warm reception in the field from women colleagues, the ability to form close ties to other men in the field, certainly the perception of being assumed to be a higher status other. And what I found from doing this project was that, inter that for black men this process looked very different in the sense that they were not really able to experience any of the steps in the processes that went to towards riding the glass escalator. For black men working in nursing, intersections of race and gender made close ties with their white women colleagues much more fraught. They were very careful and very particular about how they interacted with many of their white women colleagues. And a lot of times those interactions were very unsettling or reflected racial stereotypes that their colleagues held. These intersections of race and gender also served to erect barriers between these black men and white men who were in adjacent roles. So unlike white men who were the subject of most of this existing research, many of these black men weren't able to form these close ties to principals, to superintendents, to doctors in these fields, and they were rarely, if ever, mistaken for higher status others. In fact, the opposite was usually the case. For black men in nursing, they were usually mistaken for janitors, for orderlies, for people who were in lower status roles than the ones that they held. So ultimately, this helps to highlight that men's advancement in women-dominated professions is uneven, and it underscores the need for specific policy to attract and support men in, quote, feminized jobs. And the reason I say that is that if we look at nursing in particular, this is a field where a lot of the professional organizations and a lot of people in high-status positions in nursing will say, hey, this is a field where we need to diversify. And one of the areas where we need to diversify is to attract more men into the profession. But if we don't take an intersectional approach, it is not clear how people who are making those arguments are going to be able to not only only attract men, but attract black men in particular, and find them in a position and construct organizations in ways that are receptive to and aware of the specific challenges that they face. And we simply don't see that without taking an intersectional approach. Uh, so now I want to take a look at a broader industry and make some similar claims. So I'll talk here now about the retail industry, which is premised on selling merchandise to customers. Retail is largely comprised of hourly wage shift workers, uh, and it is a site where we've seen major companies both accused of and sued for racial discrimination. Abercrombie and Fitch, Victoria's Secret, there are uh, unfortunately a lot of examples of companies that have been sued for discrimination in retail. And so retail itself might look on the face of it like a place where there at least is some evidence from a legal standpoint of racial discrimination happening. But what happens when, again, we take an intersectional approach and look a little bit more closely? We see a different outcome. And here I'm basing this on some work by uh, sociologists Joya Misra, Kyla Walters, and Christine Williams, who have made some arguments about uh, retail from an intersectional approach looking both at the uh, toy industry and at the retail clothing industry. And what these researchers find is that discriminatory practices in retail, again, are not evenly applied. Intersections of race, gender, and class shape multiple aspects of various work practices. What uh, Christine Williams and Joya Misra and Kyla Walters have found is that the intersections of race, gender, and class mean that when people are applying for retail jobs, they might apply, apply broadly to a store and be interested in working in a particular place. But managers make specific decisions to slot white women into customer-facing jobs, which are the jobs at the front of the store and the jobs where they're going to have more interactions being the face of the particular uh, business, wearing the clothes of the business if it's a retail store, and really representing that store to customers. Men of color, however, become relegated to back rooms. They are more likely to be slotted into uh, stocking uh, things and working in back rooms where they have less of a client-facing experience and are less likely to be presented as the face of the particular brand. These retail industries, retail stores rather, also cast thin young white customers as the ideal market for these clothes, thus privileging these customers. So again, where does this leave black women? They don't fit into either of these kind of ideal typed representations of who retail stores are trying to either attract or market to. And as a consequence, they encounter discriminatory practices where they are not the quote ideal worker for any of these positions. When black women do end up being hired for these jobs, what uh, Misra and Walter's research shows us is that they not only have a more difficult time getting hired, but they also face extensive scrutiny over their appearance, do a lot of what they refer to as aesthetic labor in terms of trying to conform to meet the standards that the store holds out for what the appearance of workers should look like, which often reflects ideas around race, gender, colorism, and so forth. So these black women who ultimately, if they do find themselves getting hired, 
go through a, not only a, a more challenging experience to get to the job in the first place, but experience a lot more scrutiny of their appearance, their physical looks, their uh, makeup, their hair in particular. And these are, again, experiences that are particular to black women that we don't see if we are only taking a racially discriminatory, or a, an, a, if, that we don't see if we're only taking an approach that focuses on racial discrimination in this particular industry. And so the last example that I'll give focuses on the US, the US economy. I'm not uh, informed enough to talk about the UK economy. Uh, but in the US economy, we know that the structure of work has been shifting for several decades. Work in America is now a lot more tenuous and contract-based. We've seen this shift from people uh, mostly, uh, is mostly being able to work for one company for the duration of their careers to moving around a lot more, to having a lot less job security and being a lot more uncertain about their employment prospects in the short and the long term. We also know that education is no longer a reliable guarantor of economic stability. At the same time, wages have largely stagnated in the US for many workers, and the gains that have accrued have gone mostly to those who are at the very top of organizational ladders. What this means is that this creates a lot more emotional and economic uncertainty for many workers. There's a wealth of research that documents the adverse toll this is taking on many workers, leaving a lot of people feeling very unsure and very uncertain about their employment prospects, about work in general, and about what it's going to mean for them to experience some economic stability. So an intersectional approach, and here I base this research on a recent book by Anna Branch and Caroline Hanley. The intersectional approach shows us that workers at large are experiencing frustration and anxiety. But when we think about this intersectionally, how workers are experiencing this frustration and anxiety, and the sources of this frustration and anxiety, again, are a bit different. For white workers, Branch and Hanley find that uh, work, these workers perceive that their occupational options and the economic security that they took for granted seem to be slipping away. They had been counting on a certain level and a certain type of economic security and stability premised on getting an education, working hard, and seeing the fruits of their labor. That no longer seems quite so certain. In that context, people of color and affirmative action in particular as a policy become easy scapegoats. They turn to blaming people of color, they turn to blaming affirmative action and making the argument that it offers an unfair opportunity that people should not have access to. For black workers, again, this looks a little bit different. Not ever having that level of economic security, black workers see this, uncertain, this economic uncertainty as an ongoing continuation of past patterns. Black women in particular are disproportionately affected by these economic shifts and by union decline that has been experiencing a 50-year 50 uh, 50 shift over time as well. And resultingly, black women are facing more pronounced economic precarity but without the safety net of marriage. So we see another discrepancy between black women and white women in these cases. Whereas this research documents that for many white women, while they may experience some more frustration around the, per the perceived economic uncertainty that they are facing, they are also more likely to be married and to experience marriage as a bit of a safety net where they can count on stable, uh, being a part of a dual income partnership, uh, most often with white men who can help offset some of this uncertainty. For black women, the experience is a bit different. They are less likely to be married, and when they are more likely, and when they are married, they're less likely to be married to white men and less likely to see marriage as a safety net that helps to shore up their experiences. So this has some implications, not just for how we understand the economy, but how we think about a lot of public policy in the US. For many years in the US, public policy around anti-poverty has put a disproportionate amount of emphasis on this idea of improving marriageability and improving access to marriage. Sociologists, although we go unheard and we shouldn't be on this point, <laughs> have made the case that when we are encouraging marriage without also attending to the causes and consequences of economic instability, such as access to jobs, uh, better wages, higher wages, more opportunities for work, then we're not necessarily giving people tools for more economic stability so much as we are encouraging people who are already disadvantaged to form unions with other people who are still experiencing disadvantage. In other words, marriage is not a cure-all for poverty. Not having poverty is more of a cure-all for poverty. Uh, but policy does not make that argument. And it becomes harder to make that argument, to see that argument, without using an intersectional frame that highlights the very differences in how black women and white women as groups are experiencing these economic shifts and the consequences that these economic shifts have for them. Can you turn the timer back on? OK, thank you. So, so there are some key points that I've made here that I want to sum up. One is that intersectional approaches offer a much more nuanced look at work, organizations, and employment. 
This perspective highlights how various groups differently encounter opportunities and disadvantages. So pointing out that women or people of color experience discrimination is insufficient. It is essential to ask which women, which people of color, and relative to whom. Doing so helps to explain why some groups are underrepresented. And I want to clarify here and emphasize that I'm saying some groups because I want to make sure that we think about and highlight when we talk about intersectionality that although Crenshaw was initially framing this to focus on black women, who are a very useful group to think through when we were talking about these intersections of race and gender, by no means was she making an argument that black women are the sole or exclusive group to whom we want to focus when we were talking about intersectionality. And I've tried to illustrate that by using my example of black men and their experiences in the nursing profession as one case of this. But there are other examples that we can talk about later to make this case as well. But the point here is that an intersectional perspective broadly applied gives us a much more precise and a much more nuanced understanding of these shifts that are happening and these changes that are occurring in workplaces and a better understanding of where inequalities are present and where power dynamics are structured. It is essential to use this approach to highlight how workplaces, organizations, and the economy perpetuate these divergences between various groups and give us an understanding of why some groups are falling behind and facing fewer opportunities. So I want to uh, lead into my conclusion with a couple of uh, rousing calls for action. I want to make some calls for researchers and for business leaders. For researchers and studying workplaces, workers, or organizations, it's very useful to consider how multiple axes of discrimination may be operating simultaneously. We heard a lot of fantastic examples of that from the research today. The one that I always go back to that I think illustrates this so precisely and clearly, though, is the gender wage gap because it's just such a useful tool for pointing to why and how an intersectional approach is so necessary. We know that a gender wage gap exists. We know that it exists when you control for pretty much everything, education, experience, skill level, time, interest in work, all those things. You control for everything and you still end up finding a gender wage gap. But what we also know, at least in the United States, is that this gender wage gap is more pronounced for women of color, right? If we look at the last statistic that I saw mentioned that uh, white women earn about 73 cents for every dollar that uh, white men make. For black women, I think it's either 65 or 69 cents. For Latinas, I believe it's 55 cents. For indigenous women, I think it's closer to 43 cents. So every intersecting category that you look at, it's bad, right? It's just a bad situation. We also know some experience, some aspects of why this happens. We know that uh, women of color are more likely to be overrepresented in low-wage jobs. We know that there is extensive hiring discrimination that occurs uh, throughout industries. And we know that there are block routes to advancement that many of these women face, even when they are in higher status positions and trying to move into more high status roles within the organizations in which they are held. So we know that this is a factor. We know that this is a thing. And thinking about how and why we see these wage gaps present and how and why we see differential manifestations of how this wage gap is present is a really useful point, just as an example of the good that taking an intersectional approach can do as a researcher for highlighting where and how some of these challenges are present. And I'll also make a call to business leaders, uh, the ones in this room. It's really useful to be attuned to how company practices may exacerbate differences along these overlapping lines. As companies tout diversity, is the focus wide enough to include groups who may be disadvantaged on multiple fronts? And as I mentioned before, this will not necessarily only be black women. I mentioned the example of black men who are working in nursing, but it's useful to think about other groups who are experiencing these intersections and the ways in which they are also confronting challenges that may be overlooked. Our colleague in sociology, Margaret Chin, has a great book out now that focuses on Asian American men and women in corporate settings. And one of the things that Margaret finds is that for Asian American women, a lot of the discrimination that they experience is very pronounced as a consequence of these intersections of race and gender and the perceptions that people have about Asian American women's inability to move into high-ranking leadership roles where they can be assertive and aggressive and take charge and fit other aspects of the ideal worker stereotype. Uh, I've given the example of black men. Um, JP gave the example of black men earlier in his research. There are a number of ways that it's useful to think about how groups who may experience some advantage and some disadvantage are going to be affected by intersectional procedures and practices happening in workplaces. And it, that leads us to the question of thinking about how and whether, once these workers are hired, are organizations prepared to address the specific challenges that they are going to face, right? It's not just enough to bring people into these organizational spaces using an intersectional perspective. We also have to think about what that actually means when people come into an organization. Do they have adequate access to mentors? 
Are they experiencing uh, challenges with balancing work and family that are exacerbated by organizational norms and policies? These are all things that industry leaders can do and to think about, can do and can think about in terms of reconsidering practices that are going to affect all groups. So I will offer now a few conclusions. Uh, one is to say simply that the intersectional approach has significant utility. As I've tried to argue here, it highlights ways that some workers are overlooked, but it also reveals ways that organizational and economic practices ultimately limit workers' potential. It is a theoretical approach that can help companies and workers thrive, and it can do so by drawing attention to the broad swath of talent that many organizations have and making sure that organizations moderate, excuse me, that organizations um, manifest and use the necessary tools to help those workers advance. One of the metaphors that Crenshaw uses in her piece that I've been quoting here is to make an argument that if you think about people who are in a basement where people who are only disadvantaged by one category are standing on the shoulders of those who are multiply disadvantaged and there's a trap door that opens only to let up those who are experiencing discrimination on one axis, that trap door is only going to advantage those who, as she puts it, but for one thing would be able to compete on an equal playing field with uh, white men in organizations. Well, that metaphor is really useful because it helps us to see that if we're thinking about people who are multiply disadvantaged, they still stay in the basement. Focusing only on race, only on gender, only on sexual identity or what have you, only gives us a limited utility in moving organizations forward. And it only gives us a very narrow pathway towards organizations being able to make use of the, of the wealth of talent they otherwise might be able to have. So I'll conclude with, again, Crenshaw's own words. Intersectionality encourages us to look beneath the prevailing conceptions of discrimination and to challenge the complacency that accompanies belief in the effectiveness of the dominant framework. Uh, because as a researcher, I can't not have references. <laughs> uh, here are some of the uh, references that I mentioned while I was talking. The Branch and Hanley piece is the one that looks at black workers in the broader economy. Crenshaw's original uh, article is cited here. Again, on the off chance you've got nothing to do with your Monday night, but go back to the University of Chicago Legal Forum. Here is the citation. The Misra and Walters piece focuses on uh, retail workers. Uh, my colleague Jake Rosenfeld has done work that looks at these broader economic shifts, particularly the decline of uh, unions and the implications that that's had. Christine Williams is cited here for her work on uh, uh, Toyland and retail workers in that industry. My own work on black men nurses is the gender and society piece, and my editor would be very angry with me if I did not mention my forthcoming book, <laughs> Gray Areas, How the Way We Work Maintains Racial Inequality and What We Can Do to Fix It, which is a, actually a book for uh, lay audiences and not an academic book. So it's written to be uh, very readable to wide audiences, and it will be out uh, October 17th. So I will close with a shameless plug. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks.